10, 9, 8, 7, 6, 5, 4, 3, 2, 1, 0. Hello, my friends. And thank you so much for coming to spend part of your Thursday, April 4th, 2024 with me on this lunchtime hour stream. Kind of glad I didn't wake up early and get all ready to stream this Karen Reed hearing this morning because it was like 10 minutes long. Uh, and if you haven't seen it, it's interesting. Again, what they didn't say was just as important as what was said. For those of you who did not watch the show last night, I had Brandy Churchwell on from the 13th Juror, and she is amazing. She has an entire seven-episode audio podcast dedicated to this case. It's called Conspiracy in Canton. She's the queen of charts. She has family trees of all the players in this case. She does such an amazing job of breaking down all of the information. And like me, she's totally fact-based, which I love. So the two of us together, I thought on a stream last night together was really great because we discussed the facts and we went through some of her charts and her timeline. And I thought it was a fantastic um, conversation. Thank you, Leanne. Thank you so much. So Leanne said, what a fantastic show. I just finished watching it. Yeah, we did about two hours together last night and... Uh, it was a lot of fun. Go check it out later if you haven't seen it. Um, yeah, this hearing today was kind of a bummer. And we don't know what the decision is going to be because, again, she reserved her decision and she said she's going to have it out maybe later today, but by the latest tomorrow. And this is the buffer zone motion, remember, where the Commonwealth is asking for a 500-foot buffer around the courthouse starting on the first day of jury selection so that nobody's allowed to into that buffer zone and also uh, no signs, no t-shirts for either side, no buttons for either side, either outside or inside the courtroom. And they've also asked for a ban on all law enforcement officers who will either be testifying or who will be, even be just sitting in the gallery of the courtroom watching the trial uh, to not be allowed to wear their uniforms, which I found interesting. Now, the, the deeper I dug into this, um, apparently this is a common thing in Massachusetts. You guys have this anti-picketing law, which seems to be a clear violation of the First Amendment, but who am I, except for, as you know, a stickler for constitutionality and procedure and rule of law. And so things such as like that um, upset me, but you know, I'm not going to let my personal uh, upset get in my way of reporting, uh, this trial, this hearing to you today. So let's, I mean, the hearing's only like 10 minutes long, so we're going to look at it. We're going to look at the hearing and we're going to analyze the hearing. And as you know, I like to stop and give commentary during the hearing. Then we're going to go back and look at the brief that was filed by the ACLU. It's only about five pages. The ACLU of Massachusetts stepped in and yesterday filed a, a brief, an amicus curiae brief, which is literally in Latin uh, translated to friend of the court. So that's your Latin lesson for today, my friends. And it really is basically when an or organization steps in or the government steps in or somebody steps in to sort of help the court out in making its decision. Uh, in a friendly sort of way. And that's what the ACLU is all about, is uh, civil rights. So hit the like button right on your way in. Thank you. And also huge thank you to Maureen Francis again. I should Maureen, I should just put a sign at the beginning of every stream that Maureen Francis is already in there with the cash app, like before the stream starts, hours before. And I appreciate your support so, so very, very much. So very much. And Carter's A Corner Books and Collectibles, thanks for becoming a member. We have a lot of fun here. Uh, and Aunt Shell's Kitchen, thanks so much for your uh, $5 super chat. Melanie, check out the case of Clayton Eckard. So crazy. Okay, I'll do that another day. Thank you for uh, bringing that to my attention. I love you guys are so amazing with your emails. You um, email me topics and, and details and court documents and 
you know, articles and things that you want to see covered. And I welcome your emails. Uh, my email is fanbase at mlittlelaw.com. I do read all the emails. I don't always get a chance to respond to them all because I am, you know, a busy mom and a uh, lawyer and YouTuber. So rest assured, I do read them and I respond when I can. And Barb Nauman, thank you so much for your super chat and getting in there. Thanks so much for the very deep dive into the two missing Kansas women. You're doing a brilliant job. I'm also very in invested in the Karen Reed case. Best wishes from Kansas City. Hello, Kansas City. Hello, Barb. And I just want to say thank you because I did so much work on that case. I I dove into the Oklahoma court records and I dug up so much information and I talked about the information and the families and the issues that were going on between the parties in that case without ever mentioning any names and trying to handle it in a very respectful way. And I saw a lot of other coverage on this case, not a lot actually, but the little coverage that I did see refers to them as Oklahoma moms. Everyone in their title, Oklahoma mom's missing. Um, no, they're actually from Kansas and they were traveling to the Oklahoma panhandle and their car was recovered, abandoned in the Oklahoma panhandle. So, I mean, even the titles of the coverage is misleading. And that is another thing that upsets me. So on my list of pet peeves today, incorrect titles, people with no information who try and report on cases and, you know, that's just the beginning. Because as we go on today, Barb, <laughs> you're going to see that there's going to be a couple of more pet peeves that I have, including the trampling of uh, civil rights. But, you know, seems that in Norfolk County, Massachusetts, it's just sort of par for the course. So let us move on. Um, let's look at the hearing first, shall we? You can let me you know. Uh, you can let me know your thoughts as we go through. And of course, as always, I come to the chat for comment. So let's see how this goes. Hopefully, you can hear the volume. It's not always great on the live feed, which is another reason why I don't like to live stream unless I know that Law and Crime or Court TV will be there live. And I do not think either of them were today. Do you know? <laughs> duty ron if you know you know thanks for the thanks for the 10 spot uh so many are unprepared he is also frustrated by this in fact we were talking on the phone this morning and we were airing our grievances as if it was festivus uh right duty ron and uh thank you by the way does my new camera look amazing courtesy of my friend and mentor and fan <laughs> duty ron um, who is an amazing and a guy with a lot of integrity and he has a great YouTube channel. He has retired NYPD. He, he reports on all things true crime. And he also has a forensic perspective. His partner, Ed Wallace, is amazing with forensics. So if you're not familiar with Duty Ron, go over there and subscribe to him as well. Festivus. Festivus. Yes, we totally, Duty Ron, we're always on the same page. We air grievances all the time. <laughs> all right, let's take a look at this hearing and see what circus went on in this kangaroo court today. Here we go. Well, I found yet, so I'll just keep talking. This is Hannah's committee, who has been with Karen Reed uh, this morning. She is the sister of David Yanetti, who is local Boston counsel. As we know, Alan Jackson and his firm are from California. Smooth as butter, we call him Alan Jackson. He is not there today. And neither. That's the clerk talking and he's not speaking into a mic. So the volume should get better. Yeah. Joe, uh, who's Tracy? Tracy says Tannis is awesome. I call her queen Tannis. I love her. She's has, she's fearless. She's fearless. And her demeanor is just like, you are not going to screw with me. I don't curse on this channel, but you know what I was going to say. I find her to be very effective.
Judge, this is 22 CR 117, the Commonwealth versus Karen Reed. Can I have counsel identify themselves for the record, starting with the Commonwealth? Good morning, Your Honor. Adam Lally for the Commonwealth. Good morning, Mr. Lally. Good morning, Your Honor. Laura McLaughlin for the Commonwealth. Good morning, Ms. McLaughlin. Good morning, Your Honor. Tannis Unetti representing Karen Reed. Good morning, Ms. Unetti. I'm told that David Unetti is held on trial somewhere else. He is, Your Honor. Okay. And good morning, Ms. Reed. All right. So first and foremost, housekeeping. Mr. Lally, what is the status of the DNA? So, Your Honor, the status of the DNA, as I spoke to uh, the lab a, a few times over the last couple of days, they actually uh, were able to uh, stay late last night and finish uh, the mitochondrial portion uh, in regard to seeing if they were able to generate a profile from the. I'm going to um, <clears throat> start off by saying I think it's so rude that he just stands up with his back to defense counsel and the defendant instead of going to the podium as somebody with courtesy would do and she's going to say uh, you know <laughs> watch what happens next because he's going to have to repeat everything he's saying right now yeah <laughs> no no ob you cannot wear your free billy tibbets shirt to the courtroom but maybe you can because it has nothing to do with either party in this case and maybe that i'm not going to suggest that anyone do this but uh, OB, maybe you and I will get some free Billy Tibbetts uh, t-shirts just to wear at home on the interwebs because that, that's great. I love that idea. It is your uniform, yeah. Right, and he leans over the table. All right, here we go. I hear a sample. Can you hear him, Ms. Unetti? I, I would actually prefer, Your Honor, if you would take the podium. Or just Fine. Yeah. She's like, yeah, I'd prefer if you'd go to the podium. Uh, so, Your Honor, just to begin again, so I, I've spoken to the lab a few times uh, over the last uh, week or so, um, including this morning. Um, so, Including this morning. Um, where is Bodie Labs? Isn't it somewhere like, oh, is it in Virginia? Okay, so it's on the same, it's in the same time zone. All right, so this hearing started a little after, maybe that's why it started a little late, because he was on the phone with Bodie Labs. Oh, yeah, yeah. It's in Virginia, yeah, okay, thanks. So they were able to stay late last night and finish uh, the generating, uh, to see if they could generate a pro mitochondrial DNA profile for the uh, hair sample. They were able to stay late last night, okay? How long have we been talking about this alleged hair sample? For how long, how many months? And they said they stayed late last night. to get it done for him. Um, I was informed this morning uh, that they were able to uh, generate a partial profile. Um, they're still in the process of seeing a full profile can be generated, but they've begun the process of generating a profile from the sample uh, from Mr. O'Keefe. Um, as far as I'm a little unclear, and I, I responded with some questions uh, just for clarification purposes, because I'm a little unclear of, of whether or not a partial profile would be something they could do a comparison with. Okay, we are also very unclear. You're a little unclear, we are unclear. The trial is 12 days from today. 12 days, I put countdown on my thumbnail. 12 days from today, the trial is starting and you're still a little unclear about the testing of this hair that you have told everyone is human, that a lot of people are speculating is from a snow brush but it's already out in the public domain or the sewer of Twitter that it's allegedly a human hair. In fact, some people have gone so far as to say that it's actually John O'Keefe's hair. Um, but now we are learning that um, the DNA testing is still not done, even though they stayed uh, late last night at Bodie Labs to try and get it done. And uh, OB, thank you for helping me this morning. I said, can you find out for me how many people work at Bodie Labs? And there are between at least, you know, 200 to 300, almost 400 people working at Bodie Labs. I thought maybe it's a, you know, mom and pop shop of two. And that's why this is taking so long and they had to stay late. But, but no. So he's a little unclear. Still. Um, in regard to uh, 
the mtDNA. Um, and then I'm also um, inquiring as to, uh, so initially what I've been told is that they, if they were not able to generate a profile, I would have a report on that by the end of next week and that would essentially be the end of it. Um, that would be the end of it. The end of next week on April 12th, that is the end of next week, that is a week from tomorrow, is the pretrial hearing in this case when all motions in limine will be heard. So how would the defense possibly be able to make a motion to exclude this alleged DNA that you still don't have if you're not even going to get the report until next Friday. I almost feel like he's intentionally doing this. So I don't know. However, given this development, I'm not sure uh, other than they indicated that any sort of report regarding a comparison would likely be sometime after April 16th. Um, and then obviously I asked for clarification and I'm still waiting that as far as what after April 16th means, as far as are we talking about, you know, the week following or a month later or what, what the situation is. Um, so unfortunately I don't have a ton of clarity, but, but at least um, I'm able to, to tell the court that they were able to uh, generate at least a partial profile uh, from the hair sample. All right, so trial starts a week from Tuesday. Mm -hmm. I would entertain a motion to exclude the DNA. Um, all right, so let, let's... That's it. She's entertaining a motion to exclude the DNA, and your DNA is out, my friend. It is out, because despite the fact that you're complaining that you have not received any discovery from the defense, their obligation to give you their discovery does not start to run until you file a certificate of compliance, which certifies that you have complied with all of your automatic discovery that you are to give the defense. So you're not getting anything from the defense until you file your certificate of compliance. So what I would suggest that you do, Mr. Lally, and my, with my advice would be just like, file your certificate of compliance so you can start getting uh, the defense's discovery so that you can actually prepare for trial, which is happening in 12 days. Um, yes, entertaining, Ms. Jim, Mrs. Jim Morrison, riders on the storm. You know, this is, the, that's like, let's talk about the doors for a second. People are strange, right? This is insane. Yeah, she will entertain it, mean, meaning if the defense files a motion to exclude this DNA, it will summarily be granted because they are way past all deadlines for discovery. And at this point, it's just laughable. It's just laughable. He doesn't want to outright say, you know, we found out that this totally can't be tested and there's nothing there. And I mean, come on. So that hair DNA evidence, in my opinion, is already out. move on to what we have here. All right, so I will hear from the Commonwealth on your motion for a buffer zone uh, and for restricting clothing. <laughs> Did you see her? She's like, and for restricting clothing. Thank you, Your Honor. Um, so the Commonwealth would ask that the motion be allowed for a number of different reasons. Um, essentially, uh, what I would submit to the court is that this is not, uh, as the court is well aware, this is not a novel approach. Um, this is something that's been done in other cases and done specifically in other cases in this courthouse. Um, what the Commonwealth would submit is what's been uh, proposed to the courts uh, is an entirely neutral motion and that it applies equally regardless of viewpoint, regardless of you know content of, of signage or uh, uh, clothing items or anything else. The motion the Commonwealth filed uh, is not in essence I don't know, but his constant sighing, just it, it's just, it reeks defeat to me. There's such a lack of confidence. It's like, <sighs> every time he starts a point, he lets out this huge sigh. It's not a good look. It's not very confident. We've seen a lot of confident prosecutors in a lot of criminal trials that we watch, name some of them in the chat 
We've seen a lot of them who are very confident in their cases and we've seen them try cases and it makes all the difference, doesn't it? Makes all the difference. He's saying that it's a neutral motion because we're not just saying that they can't uh, wear free Karen Reed shirts. We're saying also they can't wear the justice for JJ pins. We're saying they can't watch any um, or, you know, wear any t-shirts that say Karen Reed is 100% guilty. So, you know, nobody can wear any shirts for either side. So therefore, you know, hey, just grant it because um, it's neutral. Free Billy Tibbetts. about any sort of protesters or any sort of presence uh, in regard to them, but more about the jurors and about the jurors' freedom uh, to, to be free and to come and to perform their civic duty free from extraneous influence. We need in this case, obviously, as the court is well aware, a fair and impartial jury. Um, so what he's telling you, read between the lines here. The people of Norfolk County do not have minds of their own. They will be 100% influenced by people standing outside the courthouse rooting for one side or the other. The family may influence them wearing their justice for JJ pins. And Oblivious Benson asked me this this morning. She said, girl, what is up? Is, is sitting in court like when you go to a wedding, like you have the bride side on one side of the church and the groom side on the other side of the church? And first of all, that's hilarious. But yeah, you can see that, um, you know, you have Karen's side sitting as we're looking behind Lally on the right side. And the anti-Karen Reed people sitting on the left side. Right? So that is kind of funny. And yeah, it, it does happen in cases where there's, and, and it's funny too, because, well, not funny, but it's ironic that usually in the gallery of a courtroom, you have what look like church pews. That is the seating in most older courthouses. And this is an older courthouse. You know, it's not stadium seating like you see in some of the newer courthouses. So, right, Fairy Raven. <laughs> Fairy Raven says, volume's too low for a courtroom video. I can't do anything about it. It's It's Boston 25 stream. That's why I put on the, that's why I put the uh, the subtitles on. I don't think anybody else streamed it live. So we're just going to have to deal with it for now. So, yeah, Fairy Raven had a good point. Great way to insult the jury. You're too stupid to think for yourselves. That's, I mean, that's what it sounds That's what I'm getting from this. The, uh, and this is something that extends beyond uh, just the impanelment of that jury. As the court is well aware, uh, as the court asks questions or inquires of every jury in every case uh, multiple times a day about whether or not that they've been exposed to any sort of extraneous influences or if they've gone online or if they've seen things uh, on social media pertaining to the case. And question I would ask is how is a juror supposed to truthfully answer that in the negative when they're bombarded with it every single time that they walk in and out of this courthouse? Um, it's not. There's a back door to the courthouse. NBC 10, you think has a better feed? Okay, let me, let me just look there for a second. Um, let's take this down for a second and hopefully that will solve the problem. I was watching Brandy with you guys this morning as well. Love Brandy. Um, every single trial that we have watched, every time the jury walks into the room, the court says, or the judge says, have any of you watched any media on this case? Have any of you looked at the news? Have any of you Googled anything? And that is what is supposed to happen. That is the curative instruction every time the jury walks in because they're not supposed to be doing any research. Okay, we have it here. Okay, wait, that's, no, they have Boston 28, hold on. You think NBC 10 Boston did it on YouTube? Hang on.
do, 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 do. Yeah, I don't see it. We're just going to have to deal with it, you guys. I apologize. If I can find it in the meantime, in the meantime, I'll put it on. Okay, apples and oranges. There are very specific rules regarding polling places and polling and elections and voting. So yeah, Mary says, uh, me, Mary says, even at polling places, the distance is very short from the building. Is anybody watching this season of Curb Your Enthusiasm? Because <laughs> uh, Larry is in trouble for giving someone in Atlanta bottle of water while they are waiting in line to vote. And it is, it's very, very funny. It's very, very interesting. Hold on, wait. I mean, the, the earliest, the latest thing I can find in Karen Reed on Boston 10 is not from today. So we're just going to have to back to this. Single time that they walk in and out of this courthouse. Um, it's not asking for a restriction on free speech or to infringe upon someone's First Amendment right. Protesting is going to happen. That's fine. It's just where it happens and how it impacts uh, the jury in this case uh, is, is what the Commonwealth has concerns about. Another analogy I would make, Your Honor, uh, is to the voting place restrictions, um, another fundamental right in which there are restrictions as far as signage and footage away from the voting place of, of how close you can be, that they're not allowed inside the building with signs related to whatever specific candidate you're supporting. You can't go in the voting booth next to somebody, take your, your candidate's sign and shove it in somebody's face while they're trying to exercise uh, their right to vote. Essentially, uh, what this motion uh, is asking is, is or seeking to protect is the freedom of the jurors who are called upon to execute their civic duty unfettered from extraneous influence. We're not asking the court to restrict the media or anyone's access to the media. And I would note anecdotally that within this courthouse over the last uh, year, year plus, there have been several instances in which jurors on completely unrelated cases have had to receive instructions from the court and been impacted by the activities uh, related uh, to this case uh, every time that it's on. <laughs> Lastly, <clears throat> what I would submit to the court is really any opposition, or at least the ones uh, that I've seen as far as an amicus, essentially, uh, the reason for the opposition is because there are parties that want to try and see if they can influence the jury inappropriately in this case. All we're asking for, Your Honor, all the Commonwealth is submitting uh, in whatever form uh, or modifications the court deems appropriate uh, based on, on the Commonwealth's proposal, uh, but what we're essentially asking for is to allow the jury to um, execute their duties uh, in this case, both during the impalement process and throughout the course of the trial as they're hearing evidence and not be subjected uh, to extraneous influences, regardless of the viewpoint of those extraneous influences during the course of, of the exorcision of that duty. Uh, for those reasons, Commonwealth would ask that the motion be allowed. All right. Thank you, Ms. Unetti. Thank you. Barb, I hear you. I see all your comments in the chat. Is it okay to hold up signs and shout at voting sites no, from 150 yards away? 150 yards or 150 feet? Somebody just put that up in the chat. And the 150 feet, actually. The Commonwealth in this case is asking for 500 yards, which is 1,500 feet. And there are special rules governing elections 
such as in Atlanta, where in Georgia, you're not allowed to give water to people who are waiting in line to vote. It's different under the law. Your Honor, I have three things that I would like to put on the record for this court. First, please note that we do not control these protesters. This has been an organic movement that arose because ordinary citizens were made aware of the case and apparently agree with us that the prosecution of Karen Reed is unjust. Speaking out against injustice is a fundamental American right. My client is appreciative of the support that she has received and continues to receive, but we in no way dictate or instruct anyone to do anything. These are strictly citizens invoking their right to free speech. Second, while we, while we question whether the Commonwealth's motion is constitutional, we are taking no position on this issue. In our view, this is between this honorable court and the general public. It is between- So, it, and I actually, I share your view. Um, I think this is something that frankly could have been done administratively, um, but I wanted to give the defendant an opportunity to be heard. So you're not taking a position on it? No, we believe that this is between the Commonwealth and the Constitution and the in the in this honorable court and the general public. Okay, you're right. I misspoke. Five hundred feet, which is still the length of a football field and a half, because a football field is a hundred yards, which is three hundred feet. So five hundred feet is a football field and a half. So maybe essentially like the length of a football stadium. Is that fair? So yeah, five hundred feet. I was thinking in football terms again. But still, that's a football field and a half. Now, we spoke last night when we went over this, how we, I was looking at the court docket and the defense had, did not file any opposition to this motion. So I was wondering if they were going to have an opposition to this motion. And she's going to say they do not. But she's going to keep, you know, she's being interrupted by the judge, which I find to be kind of rude on a couple of levels because it, an attorney loses their flow when they're interrupted and you have an idea of what you want to say. Just like I can lose my flow on this show when I see comments popping up that I want to respond to. But when you're up in open court and there's TV cameras on you, you don't want to have your flow ruined by a judge who's interrupting you for no apparent reason other than to interrupt your flow. It doesn't make sense. Public. And that while we, uh, the ACLU has filed something, uh, members of the public have filed something, they will speak to the constitutionality of this. And other than receiving our sympathy and our blessing, we are not joining in their argument. Again, we're taking no position. And I wanna make clear that our position, our intent is and always has been that we are going to win this case inside the courtroom. Your Honor, that's our, that is what we're going to do. With what a, we're going to win this case inside the courtroom, and that with that, I'll waive further argument. Okay. So I have received. I want to go back to where she interrupts her because I think I interrupted it when she she was interrupted. We're going to win this case inside the courtroom. We're going to win this case in the courtroom. She said it twice. Apparently, agree with us that the prosecution of Karen Reed is unjust. Speaking out against injustice is a fundamental American right. My client is appreciative of the support that she has received and continues to receive, but we in no way dictate or instruct anyone to do anything. These are strictly citizens invoking their right to free speech. Second, while we, while we question whether the Commonwealth's motion is constitutional, we are taking no position on this issue. In our view, this is between this honorable court and the general public. It is between- So, it, and I actually, I share your view, um, I think this is something that frankly could have been done administratively. Could have been done administratively? What, without a motion? That somebody should have just said, judge, make this order. You don't need to hear from both sides. We just, that's not what she's saying. She's saying, we are gonna let the people talk. You are talking about the people's rights. We have no position on this either way. And the reason, Kim, that I think they're taking this position is because they can't come out and say, you know, we want people outside with their free Karen Reed signs. They don't have control over what these people do. And that is their position. We don't have control over what these people do. But you now have papers from the ACLU 
who is going to instruct you about our right, our constitutional right to freedom of speech and give you some guidance in this. And there was a motion filed by some citizens in Norfolk by an attorney named Mark Randazza, which you will see she's not even going to consider. But I think that the defense taking this position was a smart one. And I had a feeling this was what they were going to do. We're going to leave it up to you, judge, to make the right decision. Because they know it's done before, it's been done before in Norfolk County. Uh, but I wanted to give the defendant an opportunity to be heard. So you're not taking a position on it? No, we believe that this is. We want to give you an opportunity to be heard, but I'm not going to let you speak because I'm going to keep interrupting you. Between the Commonwealth and the Constitution and the in the in this honorable court and the general public and that while we uh the aclu has filed something uh, members of the public have filed something they will speak to the constitutionality of this and other than receiving our sympathy and our blessing we are not joining in their argument again we're taking no position and i want to make clear that our position our intent is and always has been that we are going to win this case inside the courtroom your Honor, that's our, that is what we're going to do with when we're going to win this case inside the courtroom. And that with that, I'll waive further argument. Okay. So I have received something styled a citizen's motion to intervene. And I think criminal counsel surely knows that unlike civil, there is nothing in the mass rules of criminal procedure that supports um, intervention in a criminal case. But I've read the memo. I received it yesterday and I've read it. I am not going to hear from counsel. Uh, I do want to say, and that was a little dig. As criminal counsel is well aware, there are no rights for independent parties to intervene in a criminal case, like in a civil case. Little dig, I think, at the attorney who filed the brief, or not, it wasn't even a brief, it was a memorandum, the memo but at least she read it, but she's not going to let him speak. I don't know if he was present in the courtroom. I didn't see him sitting there. If anybody knows if he was present in the courtroom, Mark Randazza, let me know. Barb, I welcome all viewpoints here, but if you could kindly, let's see the real evidence before she's exonerated or convicted by YouTubers. If you don't like it here, you are free to go. I am not convicting anyone. I have read the entire court file. I have analyzed every single hearing. I have read every single motion that I can get my hands on. I have read the Canton police reports. I have read all the investigative reports that are out there. So please, before you accuse me of convicting someone as a YouTuber, I am here talking about the facts and the evidence and the constitutionality of what is going on in Massachusetts. And if you live in Massachusetts, you should be scared because your rights are being trampled on. Quoting the appeals court, intervention is a concept foreign to criminal procedure. Now, apparently the Civil Liberties Union of Massachusetts, understanding that, filed a motion to file an amicus curiae memorandum. So that motion is allowed. And I have read the ACLU brief. And frankly, um, I find it very helpful. And I've been persuaded by many of the points in there. So I don't need to hear from anybody. And um, the ACLU, I think, did a great job in their memo. And I understand their position. So it's undisputed that under our system of government, the people's right to protest um, is, you know, is preserved under the First Amendment, as is the free expression of their views. I have to consider, of course, this very important constitutional right. But the bedrock principle of the trial court is assuring a defendant. It is, and it must be, assuring a defendant a right to a fair trial. 
um, which includes a right to a fair and impartial jury, which by definition is a jury free from any outside influence. So my focus has to be on having this jury hear the evidence and the law and decide this case based solely on the evidence and the law that is heard here in this courtroom. Okay, so is the is the jury pool in Norfolk County that mindless that they're going to be um, they're going to be swayed by some people outside the courthouse or maybe a hundred feet or one hundred and fifty feet from the courthouse who have signs? You know, if, if everyone who so feels that Karen Reed is one hundred percent guilty, even based on all of the lack of evidence that we've seen, that doesn't even line up with him even being hit by a car. Um, why aren't they out there? with their signs that say convict Karen Reed. Karen Reed is 100% guilty. Um, because people, I have heard from people who have no personal interest in this case other than they are so offended by what is going on here. They drive 40 miles each way to come to peacefully protest about what they see as an injustice here. I have to balance the, the rights of protest. Um, the law is very clear on this. Sometimes these are competing interests, but in balancing them, in weighing all the factors, I do find that an external buffer zone is appropriate and that we do need prudent regulation on in-court expression. But the 500 feet is far too excessive. So I recognize that my obligation is that I must reasonably accommodate the rights of all people to protest in a meaningful way while ensuring above all here that this case is decided fairly based on the evidence without any undue interference from outside pressures or influence in accordance with the law. And that's what I will do. So I will have a written order and a very short decision on this by hopefully, by tomorrow, but hopefully by this afternoon. So I will see you all next week. And I intend to go through all the motions in limine on Friday. Um, I would like counsel to consider how you want to do impanelment. If there is a request for a questionnaire, it needs to be a, a supplemental questionnaire. Council need to work together. It needs to be one side, one page, two sides, no longer. Council works together. And if you cannot agree on a questionnaire, then part one of the questionnaire will be what you agree to. Part two of the questionnaire will be what the Commonwealth wants and the defendant objects to, and part three will be what the defendant wants and the Commonwealth objects to, and it must all be on one page. So I'll see you all next Friday. Okay, so during jury selection, Bye. voir dire. Oh, somebody said something happened at the end. Was there a hot mic or something? I'm going to wait for it. Oh, they, somebody said they zoom in on Karen's phone. Let's wait for it and see if that happens on this feed or if that was the other feed. Wait for it. During voir dire, the uh, jurors who come in, the prospective jurors are all given a basic questionnaire. I didn't see it on that stream, so maybe you guys meant something different. A basic questionnaire, name, you know, address, where are you from, how many kids do you have, what's your job, do you have any members of your family who are in the uh, law enforcement? And there's a basic questionnaire. Always, in every criminal case, the parties agree on a supplemental questionnaire, which may have other questions that are more geared toward this case. You know, have you watched the Nightline episode, uh, was it Dateline, Nightline? I don't know. Have you seen any media coverage? Are you influenced by the media coverage that you've seen in this case? Can you be fair and impartial? Have you ever had uh, a family member with a criminal conviction? Have you, and is that going to affect your ability to be fair? You can, you can be sure that they are going to have to have a supplemental questionnaire and that they are going to be 
um, pretty precise in their questioning. And then they're going to ask questions in voir dire. I do not know if in Massachusetts, admittedly, the judge picks the jury or the attorneys pick the jury. In some jurisdictions, the judge asks questions of the jury and basically can pick a jury very quickly. In other jurisdictions, like the Chad Daybell case that a lot of people are watching jury selection on now, it is the attorneys that do the questioning. So I do not know. Lauren De Laguna, welcome. Um, I first heard your name last night when you popped up in my feed debating uh, somebody. And I have never seen anything like it. I was riveted. Not even going to mention it here, but I believe you have a YouTube channel and people should go and watch it because it was an evisceration. I thought uh, you did a phenomenal job talking about this case with someone who has trolled me in the cesspool of Twitter for quite some time and seems to think that that's totally cool. So kudos to you, Lauren, for doing that. Congratulations. Um, and who is this, just while I'm on this tangent of people that are trolling me, who is this person called Heels in the Air? Because Barb, that might be a good place for you to go um, to watch coverage. That would be great. Heels in the Air is a person who seems to think it's cool to use my coverage on her channel and then bash me and talk about how she doesn't like me. Who is this person? Does anybody know? Thank you, Candy, for the cash app. That's very sweet of you. I appreciate you so much. And she says, I'm watching you now. I appreciate you. Um, it's insane. <laughs> Melanie Parker. <sighs> Melanie Parker wants five figures. She wants five figures to watch that one. Um, I mean, Lauren did an amazing job. A girl, I don't know how you kept it so calm. I don't know that I could do that. I, I give you a lot of props. I, I, <laughs> I get annoyed here when um, there's nobody debating me other than some people in the chat. Heels in the Air is a trashy true crime channel. I mean, the name alone. Yeah, I don't know who that person is, but but she used my video and you can see because there's still you can see the pink sparkly background in the background so it's all me and then she talks about to some other guy named trailers park somebody uh yeah i can't stand her yeah i can't stand her oh i'm crying i'm crying over here i'm so sad i'm so sad but um give me a, give me a break first of all you don't use someone else's content unless you ask them if you can use it um but then to like trash somebody about it and it was a whole thing about sean mcdonough and the taillight thing and that's the my footage that they used and my show and it's just like it was a little bit creepy so you know guide your actions accordingly is all i can say about that my goodness all right so let's take a look at the aclu brief and see what um their position is on this because the judge did say that she's going to take what they had to say as guidance. So in order to submit an amicus curiae brief with the court, you have to first ask, and they did. The first page of this, which I do not have up for you right now, is the motion to um, submit this brief conditionally. So they um, submitted this conditionally and the court did say, the judge did say that she is going to take it into consideration. So there you go. Introduction. The ACLU of Massachusetts respectfully submits this memorandum as an amicus curiae with regard to the district attorney's motion filed on or about March 25th, 2024, seeking four orders from this court. One, requiring prominent posting of general law section 268 13a in and around the courthouse immediately before april 16th of 20 oh that should say 2024 and during the pendency of the trial two prohibiting any individual from demonstrating in any manner including carrying signs or poster or making statements about the defendants law enforcement the law enforcement the Norfolk district attorney's office potential witnesses or the evidence within 500 feet of the Norfolk Superior Court Complex, which includes the parking area behind the Registry of Deeds building during the trial of this case, 
Three, prohibiting anywhere where prospective jurors gather or walk to the courtroom, the wearing or carrying of papers, water bottles, tote bags, signs, buttons, pins, t-shirts, sweatshirts, hats, or any other attire or item that contains any images or writing that suggests a favorable or unfavorable opinion of either party. <laughs> Note what they did not add to the, their list of things was um, pet clothing, which I guess they thought was so laughable they didn't even put it in there. Uh, number four, prohibiting any individual in the courthouse from wearing any buttons, shirts, or insignia related to the defendant, the victim, or law enforcement. Each of the four orders requested in the pending motion have an impact on free speech, expression, and assembly, and therefore require very close constitutional scrutiny by this court before any order might enter. This memorandum focuses primarily on the request for the whopping 500-foot buffer zone, Although the analysis below is applicable to each element of the request. Let's see if I highlighted footnote one at all. Footnote one says, we also have concerns about the request for posting the general law at the courthouse, given it may be an overbroad and insufficiently tailored restriction speech in that it prohibits picketing, quote, near a building, housing, a court of the Commonwealth, end quote, which is arguably too vague. More appropriate than posting that statute might be the prominent posting of any buffer zone order the court might enter to ensure that no one inadvertently violates it due to lack of notice. And that's a great point, because if you post the statute, well, the average person might not have any idea how to interpret that, what it even means, what they're allowed to do or not do, and only see that it's something like a $1,000 fine or $5,000 fine. I can't remember. I think we looked at the statute the other day. Of course, the statute shows that the legislature chose to restrict such activities undertaken with specific intent only when near a court, as opposed to anywhere within a 500-foot zone on every side of the entire courthouse complex. As explained more below, the court should proceed very carefully in ruling on the motion, particularly the buffer zone request, given the impact on free expression protected by both the First Amendment to the U.S. Constitution and Article 16 of the Declaration of Right which has been held to provide even greater protection for free expression than the First Amendment, including when criticism of the conduct of public officials is at issue. Here's their argument. For purposes of this amicus, it is assumed that the request for the 500-foot buffer zone can be deemed content and viewpoint neutral. Footnote two. Given it is clearly motivated by a desire to suppress speech in favor of the defendant's perceived innocence, that assumption may be questionable. And I would agree because the only people out there protesting are people with free Karen Reed um, signs. The other side is not out there in support of conviction or justice for John O'Keefe other than wearing buttons. But when I played for you, uh, Larry Foreman, the DIY, uh, DUI guy's rant last night, he talked about the trial of the Chicago 7, where there were huge protests, but on both sides of the case. And that is one of the seminal cases of, you know, courthouse picketing, protesting. And this memorandum takes as a given that there's a strong government interest in preserving the administration of justice free from undue influence. Footnote three. There is, however, a serious question whether the requested orders are necessary or effective to serve such an interest, given the huge amount of press attention that has already been provided to the, the case and the unlikelihood that many, if any, potential jurors or witnesses would not already have been exposed to it. And that's a great point. But even assuming those predicates, the court still must conclude that the requested restrictions are narrowly tailored and that they do not burden substantially more speech than is necessary to further the government's legitimate interests. In a case out of Massachusetts concerning 35-foot buffer zones near abortion clinics that were held to not meet the narrow ta tailoring requirement, the Supreme Court emphasized that by demanding a close fit between ends and means, the tailoring requirement prevents the government from too readily sacrificing speech for efficiency. Citing a case called McCullen. 
In McCullough, the court also emphasized that the burden is on the government to show that it, quote, seriously undertook to address the problem with less intrusive tools readily available to it and considered different methods that other jurisdictions found effective. Indeed, in this case where a judicial injunction, not a statute, is at issue, the standard is even higher. As the Supreme Court has explained, injunctions carry great risk of censorship and discriminatory application. And thus, when evaluating a content-neutral injunction, we ask that our standard time, place, and manner analysis is not sufficiently rigorous. We must ask instead whether the challenged provisions of the injunction burden no more speech than necessary to serve a significant government interest citing a case called Mad Madzen. Of course, of course, the Supreme Court has also recognized and discussed in McCullen that injunctions if carefully drawn to apply only to individuals or groups because their past actions in the context, context of a specific dispute between real parties may be more consistent with free expression than more general laws because given the equitable nature of injunctive relief, courts can tailor a remedy to ensure that it restricts no more speech than necessary. In short, injunctive relief focuses on the precise individuals and the precise conduct causing a particular problem, as opposed to a measure that categorically excludes non-exempt individuals from the buffer zones, unnecessarily sweeping in innocent, sweeping in unnecessarily sweeping in innocent individuals and their speech. Here, the Commonwealth's motion makes no attempt to explain why less intrusive measures are not sufficient to protect its legitimate interests. Such alternatives may include enjoining only specific individuals from engaging in certain conduct where the government shows that they have in the past engaged in unlawful witness intimidation or interference with the administration of justice. Any such violations would need to have been proven to have occurred with an intent to interfere with or obstruct the administration of justice because intent is an important element in the protection of free expression as recognized by the plain language of GL 268.13a, citing a case called O'Neill versus the Canton Police Department, which was just decided in November of 2023. Moreover, any generally applicable restrictions could be much more tailored, for instance, by only prohibiting demonstrators while expressing views about the case from approaching within a certain number of feet of someone entering or in the courthouse, restricting noise levels within 200 feet from the courthouse complex below a reasonable decibel level so that proceedings inside are not disrupted. The court conducting careful voir dire of each potential juror to ensure that they can commit to judging the matter based only on the facts presented during trial and according to the court's instructions and not as a result of media coverage or the influence of demonstrators a much smaller buffer zone and or a combination of the same. So you see here the ACLU is giving the court a number of possibilities to choose from. Conclusion, there are serious reasons to doubt that or orders of the scope sought by the Norfolk District Attorney's Office can be justified consistent with free expression principles protected both by the First Amendment to the United States Constitution and Article 16 of the Massachusetts Declaration of Rights. Certainly, the district attorney seems to not have met the government's burden to show why narrower alternatives are not feasible, and unless and until that high burden is met, the motion should be denied. Respectfully submitted on behalf of the ACLU of Massachusetts. Let's go to the the chat for a minute. Let's see if you guys have any questions, concerns, and comments. Thank you, Sherry, for becoming a new member. That is amazing. Thank you so much. Mandolin Wind, thank you so much for your super sticker and your constant unwavering support in the comments of my videos. I do appreciate you so much. Scott McGinnis, I appreciate you as well because you're always in here with the super chats. Judge Canoni could make arrangements to get the jury in the back door. It's not hard. And have she bust in her last jury in a cop on a live trial. Simple. Yes, she's done it before, right? Didn't she bust them in? Uh, Liz asked, what does that mean? Criminal versus civil. Civil. So a civil case is something that um, where somebody sues somebody else. 
a civil case, like uh, a car accident case, or uh, sometimes a defamation case is a civil case, like the Johnny Depp versus Amber Heard case. That was a civil case. Criminal case is something where criminal charges are brought and a person is on trial for criminal charges. So the judge was saying that you don't have the right to intervene in a criminal case, but sometimes you can in a civil case. For example, we see interveners a lot in family court cases. Uh, the, the, the case that I was talking about the other night, the two Kansas women that are tragically missing, there was um, the father of one of the women's children. They were in a custody battle for about five years. They had never been married. And the father's mother, so the grandmother of the children, intervened in that custody proceeding. So there are certain provisions in other types of cases that people that are not directly involved in the case have standing or the right, essentially the legal right to intervene. Mrs. Jim Morrison says, does his death certificate say homicide? No, his death certificate says undetermined. So that is interesting. Um, Boston, Mass 781, the case starts in a few weeks. The potential pool of jurors have already received the postcard in the mail. The pool is already aware, right? I would imagine, I would imagine they're gonna have to send out a lot of those postcards. I think in the, ch uh, the Chad Daybell trial, you can correct me if I'm wrong because a lot of you are watching that jury selection. I think they sent out at least 2,500 initial questionnaires. And, um, this case, with all the attention that it has received recently, and it is worldwide, my international viewers, if you're here, wave to me, wave to me in the chat and tell everyone where you're from, because while this was initially a local Boston, Massachusetts case, it has become national and it has become international. James Lynch says, Officer John O'Keefe was not hit by a car. Yep. Mandy says, Bev could have been diplomatic and treated Randaz's motion as an amicus brief instead of being snarky. Correct. They may have a remedy in federal court under a 1983 action, which is a violation of a civil rights action. So let's take a quick look at that because... She didn't even address it. She didn't even address it. Um, and she wouldn't let them speak. She wouldn't let anybody speak. And she kind of said, I'm just going to disregard it because you don't have a right to intervene. So I understand that the plaintiffs in that case raised $6,000 to pay the attorney to file this. I don't know what they're going to do next, if they're going to take it to federal court. I don't know. I don't know if they'd get a ruling quickly enough in federal court even before the trial, which is happening in 12 days, everyone. Uh, hi, Olivia. The uh, Commonwealth is literally showing us all, all, showing us all the chilling effect in real time by asking to post the statute. We're going to intimidate, silence our opposition with criminal prosecution. I mean, those of you who live in Massachusetts and in neighboring towns and in Norfolk County, you're <laughs> mad as hell and you're not going to take it anymore. I said that on another show I was on when I was on Surviving the Survivor. They said, why do you think this is so divisive? And I said, because the people in Massachusetts are mad as hell and they're not going to take it anymore. This has been going on from what you are all telling me for a very, very long time uh, in the state of Massachusetts. Dee Dee lives 10 minutes away from 34 Fairview. So I know so many of you are local. Uh, Stephanie says Norfolk County isn't international. No, but the story is, the story is international. And that's what I mean. So uh, look, even Alaska is watching. Hello, Arctic cat in Alaska. Drew, the flags are too small for me to see where you're coming in from, but uh, let me know. Let me know. A lot of people from Boston. Crystal says, is the judge elected or appointed? She was elected, correct? Just like Michael Morrissey was elected, he's ran. He has he has run unopposed many times. Jeffrey says Mark said they might have to delay the trial if they take it to the higher court. I don't think that would be uh, a good idea. Then I think this trial needs to happen. I think that Jeopardy needs to attach, and I think that she has been waiting over two years for this. 
And I think that based on the delays in the Commonwealth turning over discovery, I think a lot of the discovery is going to be excluded. So tell me in the comments, we're going to talk about this in a minute after we talk about the citizens' motion to intervene briefly. Sarah says they're railroading an innocent woman, disrespecting a Boston cop, taking total advantage of their power. It's disgusting. And I think that that's the feeling of a lot of people. Stephanie says, we are outraged. Oh, Fairy Raven is coming in to watch us from Ireland. I love that. And I love your name. I love your name. I want you to tell me what evidence you think they are going to make motions in limine to exclude. That's what a motion in limine is. A motion in limine is made prior to the start of the trial in order to exclude certain evidence for certain reasons. For example, if it is hearsay or if it is more prejudicial than probative or um prior bad acts can often be precluded from being entered into evidence at trial because they can be more prejudicial than probative. Um, let me know what pieces of evidence you think are going to be the subject of these motions in limine, which we will cover next Friday, April 12th, during that hearing, because that that's going to be interesting. People are from the next town over. We have Toronto watching. Even South Africa is watching. Monica, hello to South Africa. A lot of people from Kansas and Kansas City. I guess you guys found me the other night from the stream that I did about Veronica Butler. And sadly, she is still missing, as is her court-appointed um, custody visitation supervisor that was with her in the car whose name is escaping me right this second jillian kelly jillian kelly and veronica butler as far as i know they are still missing that is a very chilling story thanks scott mcginnis massachusetts judges are appointed by sitting governors oh for life is it a lifetime term that's we vote on our judges here our local judges uh, judges are voted on only federal court judges are appointed but our state court judges, we vote on them. But he confirmed that they're appointed. Wow. I don't know. What do you say about that? Judges are not, our judges are, my New York friends. We vote for judges every election. Hmm. That is interesting. Wow. I don't know, you guys. I, I feel like Massachusetts, that sometimes when I look at all of these crazy laws, that there are so many like that go all the way back to the Pilgrim times. Scott Starboard, thank you so much for your super chat. Bev favors the ACLU while disregarding Randaza, aka We the People, RIP Mark Massachusetts. Oh, yeah. If you haven't seen DUI guys rant on this, go back and watch it. I showed some of it on my stream last night at the end of the stream. And also, I linked the I believe I linked the entire video in the description. Let's take a look at the arguments presented by Mark Brandaza on behalf of a number, a couple of plaintiffs who are local. And it says, citizens motion to intervene for the limited purpose of upholding and defending the First Amendment by opposing the Commonwealth's motion for a buffer zone and restraining signs or clothing that express a viewpoint about the trial. And these are the four people he represents who wanted to intervene. Tracy Ann Spicuza, Lorena Jenkinson, Dana Stewart Leonard, and Paul Cristoforo. Thank you, Paul Cristoforo, for email, emailing me a copy of this motion. You guys are on it. He says, they are a group of concerned free American citizens who will be negatively affected by the relief the Commonwealth seeks and wish to be heard before this court renders its decision on the requested relief. The Commonwealth, seeks to unconstitutionally infringe upon the rights of the people to enjoy their full and robust rights under the First Amendment and Article 16 of the Massachusetts Declaration of Rights, as amended by Article 77 of the Amendments to the Massachusetts Constitution. The Commonwealth's desire to clamp down on criticism and dissent must not be given this court's imprimatur. Imprimatur means, in layman's terms, endorsement. So he's saying the court cannot endorse this. There's your 
legal term of the day. Try and work it into your everyday conversation. Imprimatur. I am P R I M A T U R means endorsement. He goes on to say, interveners have no intent to interfere with anyone, to obstruct anyone, nor to impede anyone, but they do intend to engage in core First Amendment activity, speech on a matter of public concern in a traditional public forum. The Commonwealth is not satisfied that it has the unlimited power and resources that come from one party rule, unlimited ability to tax, and a monopoly on violence. Well, that's interesting. The one party rule dig. I, I highlighted the, the stellar portions of this for you. Power has become so intoxicating that the Commonwealth has, in the course of prosecuting this case, gone on an unchecked bender, <laughs> pursuing the additional prosecution of journalists and demonstrators alike. But like any addiction, Eventually, even those who love the addict must stop enabling them. The Commonwealth wants this honorable court to feed its addiction by giving it the most constitutionally repugnant relief that can ever be fashioned, a prior restraint. Interveners resist on their own behalf and on behalf of many others who fear further Commonwealth retaliation if they step forward. If the court does not permit, permit intervention, no one will advocate for the rights of the people. These four brave patriots have come forward to do so, not only on their own behalf, but as proxies for anyone who wishes to keep freedom intact in Norfolk County. I'm gonna to break to tell you that I love that analogy of the addict and being on a bender. And I think that that is some really excellent legal writing. Uh, where they use the word patriots, there is a footnote that says, this word is not used lightly, given the way that the Commonwealth has retaliated against other citizens for challenging its authoritarianism. It truly did take bravery for them to step forward. I agree. The Commonwealth's actions in arresting journalists and demonstrators who vocally disagreed with this prosecution have had a strong chilling effect on the speech surrounding this trial. Then he asked for permission to intervene. And that is what the judge denied. She said, they do not have a right to inter intervene. They're, we do not recognize a right to intervene in criminal court, sir, basically. But he says they do have standing. He says courts permit intervention in criminal matters by third parties when First Amendment rights are at stake. And neither party is particularly suited to nor motivated to preserve those rights. Commonwealth versus Clark, where they talk about media entities motion to intervene to seek re reconsideration of trial judges order barring media from trial. We see um, media entities intervening in criminal trials a lot because the court will say we don't want cameras. So they try and intervene a lot to get permission to have a pool camera or to let their camera in there or to live stream the trial. But we don't often see individuals intervening in criminal trials. And I don't know if she's right on the law about that because I am not 100% up. On, I'm, as you know, a New York attorney. So I did not read that case. Petitioners seek to intervene for the limited purpose of being heard when the court considers the Commonwealth's motion as neither the Commonwealth nor the defense are in the position to adequately stand up for the rights of the affected citizens. The Commonwealth seeks to bind and gag Lady Liberty and must not be permitted to do so without opposition. Defendant Reed should not be asked to defend herself and the rights of 7 million Massachusetts citizens at the same time. Okay, I'll take another break to tell you that now I'm thinking this motion was made for the purpose of getting somebody like the ACLU involved and it worked. It worked because the ACLU did get involved and they did submit a brief to the court and the court did say that it was very helpful. So I think mission accomplished with this motion. Movements have stand standing to intervene relative to the Commonwealth's motion because they intend to demonstrate outside the courthouse during the trial. It's the citizenry not Ms. Reed, who would suffer the injuries inflicted upon the requested relief. 
Non-parties may intervene in proceedings where they would otherwise suffer a substantial injury to a direct and certain violation of their rights. Yes, Scott McGinnis says, true. ACLU only responded after Mark filed this. Stephanie says, a bunch of people emailed and called them too. Yes, so the more attention that is brought to this, and that's why this Commonwealth motion is backfiring on them. Because now the people of Massachusetts and nationwide and maybe even worldwide are getting riled up. They're getting riled up. They're like, wait a second. Okay. Not only have we seen the way this whole case is playing out, but now you're trying to keep people 500 feet away from the courthouse, enacting a buffer zone, you know, trying to legislate what or regulate what they're allowed to wear and what they're not allowed to wear, what their dogs are allowed to wear, um, that their signs, you know, a 500 feet, aren't there other businesses within 500 feet of the courthouse that would be affected by this? So nobody in a restaurant within 500 feet of the courthouse would be allowed to wear a free Karen Reed sweatshirt or a justice for JJ button. Um, Sherry says, speaking of Lady Liberty, the picture of the lightning strike on her torch yesterday. Wowzer, I haven't seen that. But John Monagle says, yes, the motion spurred the ACLU to act. That was money well spent. Movements intend to demonstrate by holding signs and wearing shirts with slogans on them. And then they talk about what each um, intervener intends to do. And that uh, Tracy is motivated by the fact that the uh, Sacco and Vanzetti trial happened in that exact courthouse, which Vinnie Politan on Court TV likes to point out every time he reports on this case. So she feels that her demonstration would be meaningful and she wants to communicate to everyone that everyone deserves a fair trial. And that Sacco and Vanzetti did not get one, but Karen Reed should. She wants to sign, hold up a sign that says something about Sacco and Vanzetti and that a statement that the Commonwealth is not to be trusted. And that's her right. That is her First Amendment right to free speech. Lorena Jenkinson and Dana Stewart Leonard want the public, uh, the public to focus on how this trial is conducted, ensuring that the public is focused on it and they pay attention to it, even if the public cannot attend the trial themselves. They know the press will be there and they want the press to see what they have to say on their signs. Lorena pretends, uh, intends to criticize the police and the prosecution in this case by holding up signs in support of the Canton Nine, who were previously charged with witness intimidation for demonstrating about this case. Paul Cristoforo wishes to demonstrate, to call attention to his belief that the Commonwealth, the Norfolk District Attorney's Office, and the Canton Police are not to be trusted. He intends to hold up a sign that says Free Turtle Boy in support of the journalist, Aidan Carney, who has been prosecuted for engaging in journalism pertaining to this case. He also intends to hold up signs that say Free Karen Reed. Free Karen Reed. Movements do not ask for permission for these statements and these statements exclusively, but offer them as non-exclusive examples of the lawful speech they intend to engage in. They do not intend to, nor should they be permitted to, engage in legally obscene demonstration, nor true th threats, nor incitement to violence, nor true fighting words to the extent that such doctrine still exists. So those are categories of speech that are not protected under the First Amendment. And the attorney is saying, we do not intend to do any of these things not protected by the First Amendment, such as obscene demonstrations, threatening anyone, inciting violence, or using fighting words. Again, they ask that it be narrowly tailored and say, the Commonwealth asked this court to use a sledgehammer when a fine scalpel is the only tool it should wield. Some other great phrases in here. Interveners implore this court to not sacrifice freedom at the altar of the Commonwealth's zeal. Trials are public events, and this court should not allow the Commonwealth to keep the public from participating. We want to talk about a lot of cases. The court should embrace demonstrators outside the courthouse because 
where a court may find itself checked by public opinion, it is more likely to be legitimized by wide open and robust debate. What better way for a court to show its confidence in the process than to pronounce that it has no fear of speech outside its walls? It should invite free speech. They're saying that the 500 foot buffer zone is overbroad. They don't think the inside the courthouse restrictions are too much of a problem unless the court sees no disruption. But limiting the messages that people can have on water bottles, the Commonwealth is going too far. They do have a uh, take issue, as I did, with officers being allowed to wear their uniforms inside the courtroom and say, the court should, prior to granting such a request, consider why the Commonwealth is asking for this restriction and should consider the fact that the Commonwealth may be asking for this relief in order to send a message of its own. In most cases involving a fallen law enforcement officer, courtrooms are packed with fellow officers in uniform supporting their fallen comrade. Here... Despite this being a high-profile case about a fallen officer, the courtroom has been devoid of law enforcement officers in uniform. The court should be mindful that the Commonwealth seems aware that this is a unique trial in which a fallen officer's alleged killer's trial is not being attended en masse by men and women in uniform. This court should be mindful that the lack of officers in uniform may communicate one thing if the room is void of them because they chose to remain home. I do agree with that argument as well. So that motion to intervene was not even considered by the court. And we should expect the ruling, maybe by the end of the day, if anybody has seen it come up in the court docket, I can refresh it here, but I haven't seen it come up yet. So back to the motions in limine and what we think uh, are going to be the subjects of the motion in limine. I, I have a feeling that the, the, that the Commonwealth is just going to drop this whole hair DNA issue, that they're just going to drop it and file their certificate of compliance unless they're going to put the burden on the defense to make that motion, incurring more expenses and more costs uh, just for fun at this point. Let's see. We'll go to the chat. Thank you, Scott. Scar, uh, we, we did that one already. And thank you again. Uh, Stephanie, you're outraged. And MM voice are the best on YouTube. Thank you, Stephanie, for your $5 super chat. I appreciate you so. Some of the things that I have thought of that I think they're going to move to exclude, but let me go to you guys and see what you have to say. Tina Moore says, the longer this goes on, the more corruption is revealed to the world. Yay. Somebody, um, Anna Lynn Wynn says, why isn't the Boston PD attending? Just curious. And then I saw a response in here. You guys are moving quickly in the chat. You're moving quickly. Scott says, BPD, no, Karen did not do it. Yep. Do you have anybody? This document has some very valid points, says Arctic Cat from Alaska. <laughs> and you're, you, Tracy keeps refreshing too. I don't know. I think it's going to come out after the close of business today. But I think my gut says that she's going to enact a buffer zone, but it's going to be far less than 500 feet. And maybe she will ban um, T-shirts inside the courtroom. We have seen that before. Uh, we saw that in a case in California. It was the Trezell and Jacqueline West trial where... People in the gallery were prohibited from wearing any sign, uh, any T-shirts. I mean, obviously you can't bring signs into a courtroom. Any T-shirts with the faces of the victims on them that were two young boys who were tragically 
killed by their foster slash adoptive parents, and they were both convicted of murder, those monsters. But in the boys' trial, we called them the boys, or everyone called them the boys. Classic and sincere West, the family was prohibited from wearing any sort of clothing with the pictures of the boys on it or any sayings like that. So that is something that happens, I'm not gonna say a lot, often in courtrooms. But outside the courthouse, you don't see that this often. So my thoughts on some evidence that they are going to have motions in limine about, I'm not looking, I don't see anybody who has anything in here. Um, number one, some hearsay evidence about the stuff that happened in Aruba. I think that could be more prejudicial than probative. Uh, you know, there were some witnesses allegedly that testified in front of the state grand jury who said, you know, that Karen was cursing at them and, you know, their thoughts on what that meant. And I, you know, that was the first time we heard of that was recently in that motion. Uh, some prior bad acts. I think some of that stuff with Higgins and this alleged kiss in the garage, I don't think that's going to be allowed in. More prejudicial than probative. I think that there will be a subject of a, a motion will be the blood alcohol results that were not taken until the next morning. Olivia says, there's also a public library, a private school, post office, two churches, numerous restaurants and cafes, law firms, businesses, residences, exercise studios, and parks within the proposed upper zone. I knew you would have that information because I'm sure you... You went on there, maybe you even drove around there. I don't know where you live, but maybe uh, you looked at the map. And Tina says, how will the average person or tourist know the dress code or even when they are in the zone? Oh, because they want to post signs all along the perimeter of the zones with the law on them that says you could be fined if you do any of these things. It's like a whole anti-picketing law that they have in Massachusetts. Uh, William, what is the difference between the ACLU papers and the private citizens papers? Why did she listen to one and not the other? My guess is because the ACLU is an organization that um, has, uh, I don't know, I'm not going to say more credibility, but they're an organization who stands up for the rights of people, uh, for their civil rights and for civil liberties. And she's more apt to say and they also, you know, they made a motion to file this amicus brief. And that's the proper way to do it. Um, she doesn't seem to think that there is any reason or any standing for citizens to intervene under Massachusetts law. She may not be right on that. But we heard what she said in court. So her judgment, excuse the pun, uh, is not always something that I agree with. Hi, uh, Scott Starboard. Does jury selection happen before or after she rules which evidence to allow or deny the jury to see? Jury selection will start on the first day of trial. So when they say first day of trial, that's the first day of jury selection. So these motions are to be heard on Friday, April 12th, which is a week from tomorrow. And then the, um, the trial will start on the 16th. So that's the following Tuesday. So she will rule on that before the jury is selected, hopefully. But in this case, nothing surprises me anymore. Really nothing surprises me. Tanya says they gave her guidance and recommendations, right? And she did say that she, she took that seriously, sort of giving her an out, sort of giving her an out. So what is the deal with Helena Rafferty, the chief of police? She's the Canton chief of police was in, she hit a pedestrian with her county-owned vehicle and hit it from the public? Is that what I'm hearing? And then also she ran, I guess she's elected, right? She ran on a um, a campaign of, you know, transparency and having the public know everything about everything. And now it's coming out that she hid this from the people of Canton. 
And she hit a pedestrian with an orange reflective vest. And he had surgery. Maybe more than one surgery in a crosswalk. Yeah, in February it happened, apparently. So when I say the people of Canton and neighboring counties in Norfolk County have been dealing with this type of stuff for a very long time, here's a very recent example of that. This happened in February. She hit a pedestrian in her police-issued vehicle in a crosswalk. An elderly man who had a reflective vest on had, I believe, multiple surgeries and hid it from the residents of Canton until somebody exposed it and then she had to release a statement. Wow. I wonder if the surgeries were to his, you know, lower body, because when you get hit by a car, that's where your injuries are. Um, but that's crazy. John Monagle says that's the same chief that the Canton PD didn't said didn't cover anything up in the John O'Keefe case. And also somebody wrote to me and said that Trooper Proctor, who's under investigation by Internal Affairs, was just assigned a brand new murder case. Can somebody tell me the name of that murder victim so I can verify that? Kristen Pino says it was lower body injuries. Yes, Fairy Raven says his knee. Mm hmm Scott says, I'm surprised Auntie Bev didn't just grant a motion for a change of venue to wash her hands of the case. Did anybody make one? I don't know. I, I think we would have covered that. I don't think there was a motion to change venue. But didn't she also just bust a, a jury in from a neighboring county when you guys said that she was bu um, busing in was that the Chesna trial? I can't keep up with every single trial that's going on, you guys. I mean, I cover so many as it is in different places. Yeah, Red Tail, that's what I heard. Proctor was assigned while under investigation. Yep. Thank you very much, my father's keeper. Uh, apparently, the victim that he has been assigned to is Christine Mello. Any relation to the other Mello, the Ken Mello? Olivia says, yep, that was the Chesna trial. Canterbury, Cantonbury Tales. Oh, I see what you did there. I love that. Welcome to Canton. I love that. You might get the name of the day, Cantonbury Tales. You might get the name of the day. Um, my other favorite... Uh, who won actually name of the day uh, is Nanya Shabiznis, who might be here somewhere today. Oh, somebody said no, Mr. Cheesecake. No, Mello is essentially Smith in Portuguese. Okay. Uh, but I mean, that would be a crazy connection, right? Uh, Jules says, Chris, Christine Mello, she's originally from Braintree, like Officer O'Keefe. That's interesting. Mandy says, yeah, Chesna trial, she busted jury in from Worcester County. I don't think a Worcester jury would be a good idea. Hmm. What was the name of the, I used to go see the Grateful Dead all the way back in the day in Worcester all the time. Worcester, what was the name of it? Was it the Centrum? Or the Spectrum? I think Philly was the Spectrum. I think Worcester was the Centrum. Those are some good Grateful Dead shows as were the shows that they used to play at what I will call Foxborough Stadium for purposes of this conversation, because I think that's what it was called at the time. It was the Worcester Centrum. I was right, the Worcester Centrum. I think I still have ticket stubs from that. Back when tickets had a real price, you know, there wasn't all this BS surge pricing that they have on Ticketmaster. Like they, they inflate this fake demand the tickets were nine dollars and fifty cents and ten dollars and fifty cents, and that was that was the price that was printed on the ticket, and that's how much you paid. Yeah, it was the Centrum. I was right about that. Please follow this new case. This new case of uh, Christine Mello. Okay, I'm going to take a look into it. Where's Microdots? Microdots is in here. Somebody says Microdots, love your work. I think we all do. The, I mean, the quality of those videos is really, really excellent. There you are, Nanyusha Business, prior winner of the YouTube handle of the day. 
thoughts, concerns, my friends, closings, things you want to talk about. Jippity bippity, I did get that email. Thank you. You she says, uh, or he says, she, he. I emailed you last night that the Oklahoma OSBI finally announced foul play in the search for the two missing Kansas women. Link the source for you. Yep, I, I saw it. I saw it. They did. Still no word, right? Still no word. I saw like like one or two very, very brief news stories on News Nation about it. Yeah, true. You can't even buy a beer for $10. I was at Billy Joel the other night at Madison Square Garden. It's $18 for a tall boy. $18. And they swing the thing around. They want you to put a tip on it too. Like I just, I just paid you $18 for a, you know, a whatever. Angry Orchard. That's what I like. Hard cider. Amy. Uh, so show says in Sandra Birchmore being investigated by the feds, which Proctor was involved in. Yep. Marianne, imagine Proctor investigating by feds and is on the Weymouth murder. Yeah. Isn't he also involved heavily in the Brian Walsh case? Proctor seen on news coverage of the murder yesterday. Thank you, Chief Sherry. I will go and look for that. <laughs> None of businesses. I like the new winner, Cantonbury Tales. If you're if you're lurking in the in the chat, if you're lurking and you have not and you have an excellent name, please come in and just say hi. So that we can get everybody into consideration today. John Monaco, they made two arrests today connected to the Mello case, but they were for financial crimes against the victim, not necessarily for the murder. Uh, oh, yeah, but sometimes that's why they, you know, they need to hold them on something. So if they can tie them to something that they have probable cause for right away, I'm not saying I don't know who these people are because I'm not familiar with the case, um, that they may arrest them on what they know they can arrest them are on and then hold them until they get probable cause on any connection to that murder case. Lisa says, police chiefs are not elected, but sheriffs are. You're talking about in Massachusetts? Because it seems every state is different. Every jurisdiction is different. <laughs> Chief, uh, Chief Sherry says, but still no info on the Kansas women. You had more info than the media. Yeah, because I did my research. I dove into the Oklahoma court documents, which are amazing and easy to navigate. And I, I heard that they have sealed some of the records since I got in there because there were some that were sealed that when somebody put the case number in, it does not exist anymore. So yeah, thank you for that because I did a lot of work on that stream. If you haven't watched that stream, there are two women missing uh, in Kansas, uh, from Kansas, who were in the Oklahoma Panhandle area going to pick up two children of one of the women, their car was found abandoned on a very desolate road. I'm not saying the entire area is desolate, but the road, I pulled it up on Google Earth. There's nothing there for miles, it looks like. No cameras in the area. They are missing. There may have been some blood found by the car and both women are missing and have not been located. There are a lot of pig farms in the area. Um, and there does not seem to be any search parties out there looking for these women. People have told me, I've heard from a lot of locals who have reached out to me to thank me for covering it and to tell me that we, we, I can't believe there's no search parties going on for these women. That's what they're saying. So that's crazy. Gio says, since the MSP are investigating their own, doesn't seem much is happening to Proctor. Tanya says, since she was in the company vehicle, will there be a civil case to Canton Police? Sure. Sure. They sue the driver and they sue whoever the car is registered to, the owner of the vehicle. If the car is registered to the Canton PD, they are defendant in that case. And I'm sure there will be a case. I just want to know why it was, why it was covered up, why it was hidden from the people of Canton. Isn't this supposed to be like, and no wonder you're auditing your police department. Haven't the people of Canton voted? for an independent audit of their police department? No wonder, this is gonna play right into it. William Glass, what is the impact of the DNA motion? Will the defense get the profiles they asked? Uh, no, the impact of the DNA motion will be we want, we're, we, you need to exclude this DNA for coming, from coming into evidence because despite the fact that 
Lally has been lallygagging for months and months and months about this Bodie Labs report coming any day now. It's not coming. So it needs to be excluded. We need to just put a lid on it. Not coming in. <laughs> Never going to happen, Scott. Never going to happen. <laughs> Never happening. I couldn't keep my cool the way that uh, Lauren did last night. No way. Donna says, I hope they find him. I'm still so upset we haven't found Jennifer Dulos. Mm -hmm. What about Summer Wells? Did everyone forget about Summer Wells? Um, crazy. Airplanes will be flying Karen, free Karen Reed banners for the whole trial. Yeah, within 100 and however, however many feet radius. Cattle range. There's a lot of cattle out there in, in uh, Oklahoma. Yes, being Lisa says, I'm so glad you got the info on the Kansas woman before they made it unavailable. I do my homework, you know, I just do. Thoughts, concerns, points, anything that's on your mind that you want to talk about before we wrap this lunchtime stream. Radius includes airspace, I would imagine. What, 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 what? The advocate says the police chief gave herself a breathalyzer too or initiated it? Wow. Yeah. Just give me um give me a breathalyzer. I'll take it right now. I'm not drunk. I'm just not paying attention to the guy who's in the crosswalk with the reflective vest. That's insane. Thank you, Sherry, for the Venmo. Job well done, she says. Thank you so much. Appreciate you. And Jody brought, bought me a coffee. Thanks, Jody. And says, thanks for your continued coverage on this case. You are so appreciated. And Steph bought me three coffees. Thanks, Steph. She says, you do an amazing job. And thank you for all you've done. I have learned so much from watching you. Oh, I appreciate that. You guys are the best and the most generous of crowds. So that is nuts. Keep an eye on Helena Rafferty. See what happened. She knew she wasn't drunk. Okay. Not drunk, just checking to see who's tweeting about me. <laughs> DIY breathalyzer. Yeah, only in only in the Canton Cantonbury tales, apparently. Yeah, distracting from texting while driving. Hmm. Interesting. I don't know. I can't speculate about that uh incident because I just don't know enough about it. I would love to see the police report, but I don't know if that's out there yet, but I do know who will have it. Ange Scullywonka, the Globe filed a motion to get the impounded documents. That one today? I got to go back and refresh my browser. You're talking about on the Karen Reed case? I don't see it in the, it's not in the docket. Oh, wait. Oh, wait. Yeah, it was filed on the 4th. Boston Globe Media Partners filed a memorandum in support of the motion of Boston Globe Media Partners to terminate or modify impoundment orders. That was filed today. Wow, you're on it. Haven't seen it. If anybody has it, you can email it to me. I'd be happy to take a look. Fanbase at mlittlelaw.com. And I'm wondering why. Why they're putting this amicus brief in again today. Today's 4-4. An attorney appeared for Boston Globe Media Partners. Two attorneys. That were filed a notice of appearance. Motion to terminate or modify impoundment orders. Well, that's interesting. Is she going to say that they have no right to intervene because it's a criminal case? Hmm. What say you? 
<laughs> oh, B still wants to know. So we can sit behind whoever at court though, right? Did we clear this up? Yeah, you can. You can sit on whichever side of the courthouse you would like to sit on. In some cases, you might find one side of the courthouse to be more friendly than the other, depending on how you feel about the case. I think it was the same. I don't know if anybody is here uh, who covered the Maya Kowalski case with me. I believe that same thing in the Maya Kowalski case, that people were sitting on different side of, sides of the courtroom. There were the hospital people on one side, and there were the plaintiff Maya Kowalski people on the other. Hi, Crystal. I, I hate that cesspool of Twitter so much, but if I need to know something and I need to know that it's accurate and backed up with actual documents, I look at Olivia Lambeau and I look at Lana Del Turtle. I don't know who Lana Del Turtle is, but she's got the facts. She's got the documents. And that's what I like. I'm a fact-based person. I want to see it in writing. I want to see the documents. So that's who I would recommend if you want to follow people on Twitter, which I try not to do. I do not. I have not seen the motion. I saw that they did file it. We have not seen it. Okay, I will look for it later. And then maybe that would be something to talk about tomorrow. <laughs> uh, which case? I think it's it's on the Karen Reed case. They want the impound the documents unimpounded. Uh, this goes back to like the motions and stuff, you know. So it's going back to I believe all of the other motions that were impounded, and the grand jury stuff that was impounded. But I'd have to see the actual motion papers to tell you exactly what they're looking to have un unimpounded. Boston Globe trying to get the goods, says Darlene. John Monagall, interesting, the Globe doing investigative reporting. They used to do that, but not in the last 20 years. Yeah, I, there's a, I don't usually follow the Boston Globe, but I, a lot of people don't seem to have nice things to say about the Boston Globe. Amy says that Karen Reed's car did not hit Officer John O'Keefe. Yeah, Nurse Jones' pig farms is concerning. What you talking about, Scott? Suffolk CPS found 10 to 11 reports of unfounded and the reasons are not public and won't be released by the PD to the grand jury or the public. Talk about a cover-up. You're talking about Suffolk County, New York? All right, you can email me on that later. Oh, Susie Q emailed it to me. All right, while we're here, right? Let's see. Let's see what it says. Thank you, Susie Q. Why come back when we'll, we are already all convened? Hmm. Hmm. Don't see it. Unless somebody emailed me the ACLU motion. Did you email me the Boston Globe motion, Susie Q? Fanbase at mlittlelaw.com. On Valva? Really? Wow, that's interesting. All right, I'll have to get into, I'll have to do a deep dive into that. 1100 in the chat. Let's hit the like button. Um, fan base, F A N B A S E, at M Little Law, L A W dot com. Oh, here it is. Here it is. Thank you, Scott. 1100 in the chat. Let's hit the like button. It helps push the stream out. All the YouTube things. Hit the subscribe button. Hit the bell so you always get notified when I go live because I don't have a set schedule. It's just whenever my own personal schedule allows. Scott says, please put your DNA on the like button. Proctor will not get it from us. <laughs> Tina Moose says, thank you, Melanie Little, for bringing this case and the corruption to our attention. Thank you. 
Thank you. Okay, here it comes. Amazing. Look at this breaking news and we have it. Thank you so much to Melissa and to Tracy who both just sent this to me. All right. Let us take a look together. This will be a fresh reaction. This will be like a real live reaction. And then we can talk about our thoughts. This was just hot off the press filed today. And thanks to our viewers, we've got it. This is the memo. In support of motion of Boston Globe media partners to terminate or modify the impoundment orders. This is what they're looking to have unsealed. They call it impounding in Massachusetts. In New York, we would say sealed. Docket number 199 to 201, defendant's motion to dismiss and supporting documents. Docket number 227, motion to impound, supplemental memorandum in support of defendant's motion to dismiss. Docket 228, supplemental memorandum in support of defendant's motion to dismiss. Docket 231, motion to impound, supplemental memorandum in opposition to defendant's motion to dismiss. And Docket 232, supplemental memorandum in opposition to defendant's motion to dismiss. And the Boston Globe is saying on March 28th, the court issued a memorandum of decision and order denying the defendant's motion to dismiss indictments. We went over that at length. If I recall correctly, I think we only had one side of the motion. So we talked about the motion on one day and we talked about the decision on another day. They say it appears from the docket entries that the documents listed above were considered by the court in issuing its ruling. For the reasons set forth below, the Globe respectfully submits that the public has a presumptive right of access to the documents under the Uniform Rules of Impoundment Procedure, the Common Law of Massachusetts, the First Amendment, and Article 16 of the Declaration of Rights, and therefore request that the orders impounding the documents be terminated or modified to permit public access to all or portions of the documents. And they go through the procedural history. Docket number 194 was the grand jury minutes and photographs of injuries. Is that one of the things they want? No, 199 to 201 is the first thing that they ask for. Defendant also filed a motion to impound her motion to dismiss the indictments, a memorandum and affidavit in support thereof, and grand jury minutes and exhibits lodged in support of the motion. That is docket 195 and 196. The notice of filing impounded information cited an order entered during a May 24th, 2023 hearing, as well as General Law 268.13DE, which pertains to grand jury minutes and documents, docket 194. Both the motions to impound and the affidavits filed in support thereof cited as grounds for impoundment that the documents made in reference, that the documents made reference to are considered. All right, I'm going to start there again. The documents made reference to or consisted of grand jury minutes and exhibits. Dockets 195 to 196. The docket indicates that the defendant filed her motions to dismiss the papers on January 10th, 2023, and each was impounded. That's 199 to 201. On February 21, 2024, the Commonwealth filed a 49-page opposition to defendant's motion to dismiss. Docket 216. The detailed opposition, which is not impounded, Address the specific arguments made in impounded motion papers filed by the defendant and included multiple references to grand jury testimony, including testimony that the defendant challenges in her motion to dismiss. And that, okay, they just reflect, refreshed my recollection. The only part of that motion that we could get a hold of was the Commonwealth's opposition. So that's the only thing that we looked at. And we were, we were able to glean a lot of information from the federal grand jury testimony and the state grand jury testimony from reading the Commonwealth's papers, but the defendant's motion is still impounded and that's what the Globe is asking for in these papers.
So they want all this stuff, which is going to have a lot of stuff in it. For example, they want to see. I had a question about this too. Why was the Commonwealth's opposition not impounded? Because they wanted the public to know everything that was in their papers, and yet the defendants motion was still impounded. It didn't make any sense to me. And apparently, somebody at the Boston Globe agrees that it does not make any sense to them either. Why should you impound one and not the other? So the grand jury testimony that they're looking for is the grand jury testimony of Brian and Nicola Albert and several other witnesses. Grand jury testimony of Timothy Nuttall, Anthony Flamati, Ms. McCabe, and Ms. Roberts. Grand jury testimony of Dr. Irene Scordy Bello, who is the medical examiner. Grand jury testimony of Brian Higgins. Grand jury testimony of Sergeant Lang, Trooper Proctor, and Julie Albert. Grand jury, uh, they're quoting, the grand jury heard testimony from Ms. McCabe, Ms. Roberts, and the recorded interview from the victim's niece in regard to the defendant stating that she did not remember going to the residence on Fairview Road with the victim. Quote, the grand jury heard testimony from all of the police officers that arrived prior to Sergeant Lank and their conversations with the defendant. Sergeant Lank, quote, clearly testified that he was relying on his memory of what was told to him by other officers who preceded his arrival, all of whom testified in front of the grand jury. Referencing Sergeant Lank's supposed failure to disclose his relationship with the Albert family. At 37, referencing Trooper Proctor's testimony about the ring video and that the entire video was shown to the grand jury. The grand jury was also permitted to access to consider testimony about the conveniently missing portion of the ring video, the defendant's access to the account, and the defendant's statement that she knew where the cameras were located inside the victim's residence. The, quote, formal introduction section of the report regarding the interview with Christopher and Julie Albert was read to the grand jury by Sar Sergeant Pukenik. Both Christopher and Julie Albert testified before the grand jury, and neither they nor any of the witnesses present that evening testified to the presence of Chris or Julie Albert at 34 Fairview Road at any point that night. Jennifer McCabe's cell phone extraction was admitted as an exhibit before the grand jury. Grand jury testimony of Julie Albert, Christopher Albert, and Jennifer McCabe. The testimony offered to the grand jury detailed an incident four weeks prior to the victim's death where the defendant became enraged at the victim for speaking to a female friend who was on their group vacation in Aruba. The grand jury was also permitted to consider testimony that days prior to the victim's death, the victim expressed a desire to terminate the relationship and the defendant refused to leave the victim's home. Testimony of Mr. Higgins and the victim's niece and nephew and a voice recording of the defendant and Trooper DeChico's testimony and Trooper Guarino's testimony and the Boston Globe wants the receipts on all of this. Wow, what are you, this is crazy. They want the receipts. I mean, this is, uh, this is 17 pages, but they're arguing the public has a presumptive right of access to the impounded materials under Massachusetts and common law. <laughs> How do you think she's going to rule on this one? They're saying that the entirety of the documents at issue should not be impounded and they should have a right to see them. Well, this is going to be an interesting turn of events. Thanks, you guys, for sending this to me. I'll have to look at it in more detail, but at least now we know the Boston Globe is really stepping up and saying that the public has a right to see all this. And I'm imagining that their argument is like, look, the Commonwealth put their papers out there. They didn't impound them. Why can't we see what the defense had to say about this? They, the public, has a right to know. Interesting stuff. More constitutional law. What say you, my friends? 
Hello, TB. About time the media finally starts speaking out against the suppression of free speech in this county. Yeah, you guys have some real issues with free speech there. So do they have a right, says Lane. I'm going to have to look at this in more detail and look at some, maybe some of the case law, but my gut says, why should you not impound the Commonwealth's response to this motion and only impound the defense's side? That's not fair. If you're going to release one side to the public, certainly the public has a right to see what the other side argued in their motion. Um, and this was for the motion... Hold on, let me just go back. This is the motion to dismiss the motion to dismiss the indictments based on not providing the state grand jury with proper facts, proper evidence. There was we went over this motion at length. I'll link the that the streams that we went over this particular motion, the defendant's motion to dismiss at length and the Commonwealth's response. And I think the hearing on it as well and the decision. So there are a lot of streams, hours and hours of coverage on this, but um, this is interesting. Why, why was, and I said that at the time, why is the Commonwealth not impounded when, and I think that the grand jury testimony parts of it may not be, unsealed because grand jury testimony is supposed to be secret and that's supposed to be sacrosanct, but I don't know. I mean, that's crazy. So we'll see if she's going to allow the Boston Globe to make a motion here and even address it. They're not acting to asking to intervene. They're asking to unseal the order that impounded all this stuff. That's right, Jennifer. Um, distortion and omission of the facts presented to the grand jury. That's exactly what it was for, Olivia. Thank you, because sometimes my brain works faster than my mouth. But that's what that original motion to dismiss was based on. It was the motion to dismiss the indictment based on the distortion and omission of facts presented to the state grand jury. Jennifer says, how can journalists give a full picture if half of it's impounded? Exactly. That's exactly right. Thank you, Lane, for your super sticker. I appreciate your support so much and the support of all of you. And Shari, thank you. Thanks for saying great live, great info. I appreciate that. And Lane, I think I just addressed your super sticker. Yeah, this is, um, we're outraged. We are outraged. I don't have much more time for you today, my friends. I'm sorry we need to wrap this, but thank you to the two viewers who quickly emailed me a copy of this so that we could look at it while we were live here so I can put it in my title of this video because, you know, as the, as the stream changes and we go to different topics, we have to change the title of the stream. Tracy and Melissa, thank you both so very much. I appreciate you with all of my heart. We are outraged. We are outraged. To my moderators, thank you so much for keeping it classy in the chat today. Uh, these streams on this case can be somewhat vitriolic at times. Uh, thank you to my viewers, my replay viewers, my channel members. Please just hit the like button on your way out and subscribe. It doesn't cost you anything and it helps the algorithm. It helps the channel. And it helps it get pushed out to the masses because after all, the reason that this case is international is because of the people who have been investigating it from the beginning and the loudest voice and the loudest voices. And sometimes the squeaky wheel gets the grease. But I know that so many of you are outraged by the violation of your constitutional rights that appears to be happening right there in your backyard of Massachusetts. As always, my friends, feel free to email me with your thoughts, questions, comments, and concerns. Please be respectful in the comments. We respect differences of opinion, but just try and do it in a respectful way. We don't, uh, you know, no personal attacks on me, my guests, my moderators, each other. It's just, it's not right. And with that, I say, as always, be cool, be kind, be classy, my friends. It is not hard, really. Really, it is so not hard. Have a great night. 
stay safe.